Stay tuned for a special edition of the Multifamily Deal Lab podcast management because we've kind of flipped our equation uh, where you know you can have an emerging market but if you especially in the small deals if you don't have ownership uh, ownership per se through your management people or uh, management team or investors uh, then we don't really go there so um, we had the boots on the ground uh, management uh, with uh, with a flipper background, which is another great, so they had the team that could go in, uh, fix up units. And, um, and then they also were able to bring on some uh, collectively going on at the same time, which I know you'll get into is, you know, raising the money and an investor was very interested in the deal. So we had kind of three parts of it together. We had boots on the ground. We were excited about it. We, and then we had a, a manager, uh, an investor who's going to come in with, uh, a significant investment as well. So we kind of all work together as a team. So those three parts of the equation. Build, build, build. Welcome to the Multifamily Deal Lab podcast, where we dissect a deal before your eyes and ears so you can discover the strategies and tactics that got each deal to the finish line. Strategies and tactics that you can put in your own toolbox to get you to the closing table. From sourcing the deal, raising, due diligence to the property takeover, Multifamily Deal Lab shows how you too can get the deal done. And now here's your host. David Lindahl. Oh, Matt, Greg, welcome to the show. Welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab. Great. How are you? We're doing great. Thanks so, father, father, son team. Explain how. Explain who got into real estate first and how you brought the other one in. Okay, so uh, I got in real estate first. I was in, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer. I earn my money by the hour. I was interested in this concept of passive income. It sounded very exciting to me. The idea of having uh, an asset do work for me, and that is generate money for me, was appealing. So I started back in 2010, 2011, looking around and uh, started to uh, bought my first deal. I started obviously through uh, the RE Mentor Program. Um, and even before, I, I think I just started with a coach and uh, it started to buy some small deals. Uh, first deal I bought was a six unit up in Nashua, New Hampshire. So you're from, so you guys are from, uh, from Lowell, uh, Massachusetts, Lowell, Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah. North of Boston. In so Na- of Boston. actually Nashua is Nashua closer than Boston to where you live? Yeah, no, yeah. actually Nashua was uh, on the recommended list at the time. It was 13 miles North of uh, Lowell. I drove up there. I said, I know Nashua and I found a broker and started looking at deals and we, uh, we bought one. We bought this empty, mess of a building that was in an estate and uh it had four different types of roofing material it was a mess oh wow and it was a total reposition so my first deal was a total reposition Uh, it was five unit a five unit deal so around the time and i'm still practicing law full time at the time and uh and around that time greg who's graduated from college gets laid off from his job and i said you know it's time for an internship and uh he was living in the house at the time. And so for a, a year, to give him credit, he stuck with it for a full year. I promised him a trip to Vegas. We went to Vegas on the famous bus trip. Uh, and because uh, Greg Greg likes Vegas. Um, and that was- <laughs> that was, that was, Which that, bus trip was that? Was that was that an immersion bus trip? Yes, or, was. yeah, yeah. I always tell no. people, my, my dad didn't tell me it was a real estate conference. He just said we were going to <laughs> Vegas. So I said, all right, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, yeah, it was uh, September of, uh, it was September of 2013. And my father uh, died and we buried him the day before we were flying out to Vegas. Oh, wow. And I was like, I was crushed by the loss. Um, And I said, I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta do this trip. I got Greg involved and. It was painful, but I went. It was great to have Greg there with me. And uh, well, the rest is kind of history. Greg has run with the company ever since. And most of the deals we've done, he's done. So Greg, so what, what were you thinking about real estate and your father trying to pull you in? Um, well, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I just like the idea of building you know, a family business because you know, my dad's been in a family business for you know, his entire life as well. But more so because I did have an experience before I got involved with another job 
and I absolutely hated it. Just, uh, you know, behind a desk all day, you know, no windows in the office, just sitting there. And, um, you know, I remember I, I actually got laid off from that job. And, you know, it was a big layoff. People were, you know, crying when they lost their job. And I was, you know, giving a little fist pump on my, my way out the door. Um, and I just knew I, I didn't want to go back to that. So I um, tried to, you know, take advantage of this opportunity. So you haven't had a job since? Uh, nope. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so how many deals have you guys done together so far? Um, Get the number, Greg. <laughs> yeah, uh, probably like 15 to 20. 15 to 20, nice. All right, so let's, so let's talk about this one. Uh, it, it, for other people that have, uh, are uh, working with a family member, do you have any advice on family dynamics? You know, the do's and any do's and don'ts since you've been working together for so long? Um, I'm really lucky. I mean, I think, um, yes, obviously, because I had, so, <laughs> so it was a trip to New Orleans and I tried to get my other son involved because he likes music and jazz. So I said, hey, we're going to New Orleans. And, uh, <laughs> was that for Ultimate yeah. Partnering New Orleans? Yeah. yeah. Was, was that for the Ultimate Partnering when we did yeah, it in New yeah, Orleans? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And okay. but he he had fun, but he never got involved in real estate. So <laughs> he never went to the he never went to the class. <laughs> yeah, so he he's a school teacher now out in Oakland. So that was his, and I thought that would be a good thing for him to learn too. You know, have a little real estate background, be a school teacher. You know, a supplement and, but you know, just didn't have the interest. And uh, so I guess that's the thing. You know, the net the interest uh, is going to naturally percolate. You know, it, it may not. Um, and you just have to move on. But Greg really uh, ran with it. He, uh, the strengths he had was he was kind of focused. Uh, he liked the numbers. He liked the analysis. He loved doing the underwriting. But, you know, Greg's, uh, Greg was a great athlete. He's quarterback of his high school football team, uh, all Catholic conference baseball player. I mean, he was a successful guy as an athlete, as a student, played division one baseball. So he knew you know, he had to put in the work to get to a place and he hasn't been afraid of grinding it out, which, which it is. And he evaluated all our deals. And I guess the other thing, Dave, is that strike price number. Like, yeah, he never, we've come so close on deals and he just stays in the pocket, very disciplined, disciplined. which made me feel more comfortable and being more pushy because I knew Greg could, kind of keep the reins in on the numbers. So that's the big dynamic, the, the, mix, the mix match that I'm gonna push, he's gonna kind of analyze. Um, so uh, that, was, that was a big dynamic. And that's, as I said, I'm a part of a family business. I'm a fourth generation lawyer. I practice law with my father, my uncle, my cousins. And so uh, it's, a, it's a fun place to be. And that's why I really wanted to do it through real estate. Wow. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about this uh, 64 unit deal in Melrose Park, Illinois. First of all, why Melrose Park, Illinois? Um, well, it was really a uh, uh, boots on the ground partnership. We developed a really strong relationship with uh, Fabian and Nicole, who are RE Mentor students. And we, we met them through RE Mentor. And, um, you know, we weren't necessarily looking in greater Chicago, but uh, again, we developed a strong relationship with them. They had a lot of experience in real estate and had a good team in place there, had a, um, you know, a, a fix and flip background. They, they um, yeah, so they're just well plugged into that, uh, that community. Um, and we were really comfortable with the team they had in place there. Um, and they were looking to scale up to larger multifamily deals. So we brought that sponsorship ability and some more knowledge you know syndication knowledge to the table um so it was really a, a team play or a strong boots on the ground partnership team play uh chicago is a primary market diverse local economy it's not necessarily an emerging market but you know we, we know the pot we have the boots on the ground partners we know the pockets where where to be where not to be the emerging neighborhoods um on the micro level um so that's really what what drove us there so when that deal came on the table, what was it? What were they? What was he asking? Um, so it was off market. So I think they were asking like four point two. Um, it was an interesting deal. It was actually under contract twice before us. 
Um, but because of the way the property was run, the financial financials were, were a mess. It was, you know, mom and pop, no real bookkeeping. So we, during our due diligence, we had to, uh, you know, pretty much build, you know, our own financials to looking at. Um, All right. That's a, that's a, that's a good point right there because, you know, when you get into these deals that are hundred uh, under a hundred units, you do run into that where you've got a mom and pop owner, and they're not really they're not really looking they're not uh, keeping the books mm -hmm. uh, in any organized fashion like on a QuickBooks you know uh, you, a lot of times you use pencil and paper and a lot of times they're not, they're not even doing that mm -hmm. uh, you know and they're just taking money out when they need it type of a thing a lot of times you know a lot of these deals I'll avoid them I'll avoid them at all costs you know every time I think I've done three or four of these and it's take, it takes so long to reconstruct. You know, and then when you do reconstruct and you look and uh, the ones that I did, they were close, they were either at break even or losing money and then even realize it. Yeah. They'd tell me, no, we're not, we're not losing money. It's like, it's right here on paper. You, know, <laughs> you gave me all the receipts. I have it. Yeah. You're losing money. Hmm. But anyway, so talk about how you reconstructed the books to, to get this deal, to really be able to analyze it properly. Yeah. So we just got all the bank statements, all the utility bills were the biggest, that was our biggest issue we ran into. Uh, so we had to get all the utility bills. Um, and it was definitely a hassle, definitely took up a lot of time, but I had to go through every single utility bill. Then I had to cross-reference the bank statement, make sure that they were all paid and, and you know, they matched what was coming out of the account. Um, so that was the biggest, the thing I spent the most time on. Then of course, you know, we had to, the income as well, you know, cross-reference what they're saying they collected versus the bank statements. So really- were, So were, were there any discrepancies there? Or, they were pretty- uh, they were pretty spot on. I mean, they definitely had a lot of late fees. They weren't paying their bills on time. Um, so what about, had, were they accepting any cash? You know, yeah, that wasn't reported. Uh, they, everything was pretty much reported. Um, they were collecting. Oh, that's good. Yeah. They were collecting cash, but it was all getting deposited into the account. Um, so that's usually I, the, just, that's usually the biggest discrepancy, you know, when somebody owns a property and then they tell you, Oh, you know, we're, but we're, you, know, you won't see it on the bank statements because we're accepting cash. Mm -hmm. and they say, well, okay, well then, you know, deposit that cash into the bank, yeah. you know, for the next couple of months and, and prove that, that that cash is coming in. And a lot of times I can't, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's, that's a unique situation where they're actually collecting the cash and putting it into the account. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it took a while, but everything was, you know, recorded on, on the bank statement. So we were able to sort through it all. And all the, all the numbers worked. Yeah. Yeah. They worked. Um, yeah. They, they, you know, worked well. They, um, you know, the utilities were a little bit higher than what they had, what they had, you know, said, but um, for the most part, it was all pretty, uh, you know, came out looking pretty good. So what'd you think Matt, when he said he, the deal works? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's really important that, that he mentioned at the beginning, the boots on the ground management, because we've kind of flipped our equation uh, where, you know, you can have an emerging market, but if you, especially in the small deals, if you don't have ownership, uh, ownership per se, through your management people or uh, management team or investors, uh, then we don't really go there. So, um, we had the boots on the ground uh, management uh, with uh, with a uh, flipper background, which is uh, another great. So they had the team that could go in, uh, fix up units, and um, and then they also were able to bring on some uh, collectively going on at the same time, which I know you'll get into, is you know raising the money, and an investor was very interested in the deal. So we had kind of three parts of it together. We had boots on the ground. We were excited about it. We, and then we had a, a manager, uh, an investor who's going to come in with uh, a significant investment as well. So we kind of all work together as a team. So with those three parts of the equation filled, we felt pretty good. Explain to everybody why you don't do uh, business in markets where you don't have a partner that's actually in the market when you have a smaller deal, say between 40 and 75 units. Yeah. Well, Greg has lived it. Do you want to take that, Greg? <laughs> Uh, it's hard to find a good third party management company. <laughs> um, that's pretty much the, you know, the one sentence version of it, but yeah. Um, you know, and let me just add to that. It's hard to find a good property, a good third party management company because there's no, you can't afford to pay somebody to be on site. Yeah. Yeah. Unless so we, you get a resident, resident manager in there. 
Exactly. And even then, those are the, sh um, well, let me see. I'm trying to think of a nice thing to say because there could be some resident managers, you know, on the line, but, yeah. you know, they're just, they're, they're not the easiest people to deal with. Let's put it that way. They kind of run their own business inside of the business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I found anyways. Yeah. But yeah, the hardest thing about these smaller properties is the third party management is you can't afford to have somebody on site. So therefore there's nobody really, you know, nobody's guarding the gate. Yeah. Right. So it really became kind of like you took uh, uh, Fravian and Nicole who just have great work ethic and had done the flipping in a lot of uh, areas in the greater Chicago area. And we kind of trained them or elevated them and they were students here. And as they were moving along, they were learning the role of being an owner investor uh, of, a, of a multifamily. And that was a real easy bridge to cross because they had all that technical and, uh, you know, uh, technical expertise on how to flip and fix up places. But now they were learning like, well, why, you know, why not just flip it and turn it? Why, why are we going to hold and hold on to this? And how did that all work and syndication and all that? So that's uh, what we've learned is tried to find that type of personality that wants to become an owner investor, <clears throat> use of real estate, and then bring their skill set into the onto the team. How long did it take them to realize it's, it's an easier life when you buy multifamily properties than it is to wholesale? Well, so the background is this was the second Chicago deal we did, and they always come in twos. Uh, so we had done a deal in South Chicago, which is still we still have that is a with Leroy Brown. <laughs> Did you do it with Leroy Brown? No. Okay. no. He's our on-site manager. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so they were going through and struggling through, <clears throat> and still are to a lesser degree, but uh, a reposition, you know, new roofs, new brickwork, new stonework, uh, new sidewalks down in this South Chicago uh, deal. We bought it really cheap. So they were in the labor of a reposition this one was not that deal. This is pretty much uh, cash flowed from the first three months. So I think they're in that experience going from the reposition to this, they've really seen this is a nice life. And it is a nice life if you have the patience to hang on and get through those brutal repositions. And most mm -hmm. all, our, I'd say a majority of our deals of the 20 deals we've done are repositions. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a lot, you know, usually, you know, you get to a certain point and you burn out of repositions. I, I always say that a reposition shouldn't be more than 30% of your, um, of your portfolio because of the amount of time it takes and the amount of wear and tear that it has, yeah. but the rewards are huge. That's it. The upside. And I think Dave, because they were a little bit smaller, you know, it wasn't that much pain. I mean, I remember hearing about some reposition you did somewhere and, you know, Huntsville. hundreds, hundreds of empty, you know, I, I just, hundreds. Yeah, I couldn't, I, I remember hearing that story. It's like, I, I don't think I-, I I'm gonna avoid that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I tell we that did, story. We did a 64 that was half empty, you know, half, uh, you know, burnt out buildings. And, uh, but it, the, the, the numbers are just so compelling that if you can hang in there and not burn out your team on, in the reposition phase, we're living off it now. And, we, and we've, we've held them longer than we ever anticipated because they're cash flowing and they're, they fund our operating business. They, they pay Greg's salary. So, you know, what's wrong with that? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Now let's talk about this. You guys got this uh, deal under contract pre COVID and then COVID started happening. So what, what steps did you take to ensure that you actually had a property that was going to survive COVID? Um, yeah, we, we just negotiated a, an extension. Thankfully the sellers were, uh, you know, good to deal with. And they granted us, it was a 90 day extension. So it was a long extension. Um, was this like in March, March to June? Yeah. So everything we, we had it under contract for a full year. So we got it under contract in January of 2020. Everything was pretty much going smoothly. We were planning on closing, I think May of 2020. Um, it was going smoothly. And then, you know, COVID hit and, you know, our lender dropped, you know, dropped us, not just us, but they kind of shut down completely. Um, and uh, so we, we just had to go to our, the seller and say, listen, no one knows what's going on. We need an extension. And, you know, we didn't really, you know, we went for a 90 day extension. We didn't really, you know, I, I know a lot of people were getting 30 day extensions, maybe 
45 day, but we just said, listen, 90 day extension, or, you know, we need to see what's going to happen. And um, I think again, since they had it under contract twice before, and those buyers weren't able to make it work because of the financials, I think they, they didn't really have a choice, but to stick with us. Um, mm-hmm. And we also neg- negotiated a hundred thousand dollar closing credit. So our contract price was uh, 4.15 and we got a, uh, got it down to uh, 4 million 50,000. Um, was, was the closing uh, credit for a repair allowance? Um, yeah, we, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was just, uh, I guess I'm not really sure what we, what we put it towards, or, or I mean, we put it towards repairs, but you know, we just kind of called it a, a credit one way or another. So mm-hmm. the other, the other thing too, is that we, you know, our, I mentioned we had a large investor who was interested in, you know, investors get very nervous. And we thought everybody could picture, you know, an apartment building empty or apartment, worse, an apartment building full with a bunch of people not paying rent, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that put everybody nervous, everybody froze, lenders froze, investors froze, and um, getting the extension. But then the, the viability of the market, you know, and trying to look beyond it, knowing that it's not going to last forever. Kind of, we stayed. We didn't have any uh, second thought about just staying the course because we say, you know, you're going to these things just are going to take time for everybody. So it wasn't going to hurt us, but we were going to stay in because we liked the deal and everything was in place. And just as everybody calmed down, and things went on over time. And then, uh, then eventually, we were able to close. And we were really just uh, looking for the collections, you know, every month we'd request from the broker, you know, the, the collections and the bank statements, and we'd get those every month, make sure they didn't fall off. I think April of 2020, they did dip the most, but then they, all the tenants caught up. So then in like May and June, oh. collections were higher than, you know, their, uh, wow, that's great. Their, their so rental. The, um, uh, they caught up, did they, did they uh, catch up on their own? Did they use any housing? Uh, housing money that was available at the time no it was all all their own it was good tenants um yeah all, they, they caught up and there's pretty uh pretty yeah the the collection stayed close to 100 percent throughout throughout 2020 um you know the so there was a lot you know the it was a mom and pop operation so a lot of people were paying late but the you know the they weren't collecting any late fees or anything like that so it's kind of collecting throughout the month um, but they were doing that before 2020 anyways, that was just how they were running the building. Um, but yeah, the collection stayed strong. So we just hung in there and continued to analyze it. And, um, and, you know, after the 90 days, we, you know, we, we decided to move forward. But you, you said that you, when did you close it? Uh, January of 2021. So we had it under contract for a full year. You had it under contract, you had, but when you went in January, you had, you had 90 days from that point. Did you keep getting 90 day extensions to watch the market? Uh, so, pretty, the so, yeah, it was a very, so pretty much the after 90 days, the contract, so we actually had more than a 90 day extension. I guess the contract restarted after 90 days. So, pretty much it fell out of contract, but, or I guess we we're in contract. It was 90 days, and then we started uh, the, fi- the financing period started again after that 90 days. So, we, then we, Re-engage Did that them. happen three times? Um, so it, I'm trying to think of the timeline. So around, so in COVID- I guess it's irrelevant. You know what, you know yeah. what I want to ask you is where did you get the money to fund the deal? $1.6 million raise. Yeah. Where did that come from? Um, so as my dad mentioned, we had one, uh, one partner <clears throat> in the deal who actually, who was actually a GP as well, who um, kind of, was a big, big part of the deal as well. Um, and he, he kind of stuck with us through, through this entire process. Cause you know, we wanted to make sure if we're going to keep it under contract, we're, you know, we got to keep our investors in mind as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, he stayed in the deal. Uh, we gave him a portion of the GP. Um, and then once that 90 day process was up and, you know, the financing period started again, uh, we started with our lender and then we just started the full kind of syndication process again, where we had our investment summary put together and just pitched it out through our, through our network. And um, at that point, you know, we were able to, to raise the money from our investors and then, you know, Fabian and Nicole were able to raise some money as well. 
Okay, so you had one larger investor and then you went to both your networks. How do you typically put somebody into your investor network? Where do you find your investors? That's what that's really what people want to know. Not you personally, but I mean, yes, you personally, but then I can go after your people, but they want to yeah. know how do, how do people do this? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I guess one thing that triggered it too is to say once the banks got a little lighter, it was easier to turn to investors and say, hey, the banks are now back on board. They're going to finance these things. So one thing is we have a, our, sta our normal stable of investors, many of them that we've been through the RE mentor program. And through the different events? Yes, absolutely. During the, you know, we've hit all those, hit all the events every year. So I think you've been to every ultimate partnering, haven't you? I think, I think we were at the original and we've been to all of them. It's a great event. And then the sponsorship this, event we had. Uh, I'll, I just want to do a plug. Ultimate partnering 2021 is happening in Dallas, Texas. Uh, first weekend of October, we just signed the contracts. Oh, terrific! All right, yeah, I was born in Dallas, so it'll be a homecoming. <laughs> I'll be at home. Oh, there you go, awesome. So, uh, that has been a, a, a group, uh, our best, our, our investor base in New England. We've spent some time grooming them and educating them uh, about the fact that we are out of the market, that we are we're, we're out of the, the region, and that was a big step for us because we started in New England. And the people say, well, what the hell do you know about Alabama? Or what do you know about Chicago? Or, and that took, took more time. And we constantly are in touch with our investor base. Everybody, everybody who invests with us gets their monthly reports. They know everything about our deals. I mean, total transfer. They know the names of the tenants that aren't paying rent. They just That's have awesome. so much detail that we, over, yeah. we overdo it. We give them every detail. And so I think that's helped uh, keeping a rapport so that when another deal comes up, we say, hey, by the way, we're moving into this market. May, might you be interested and feel them out and then just keep them, uh, keep the information flowing. I guess that would be the advice is keep as much information flowing, going to them as was what you're doing in the day-to-day -day operation. And they, they get into it. They like it. They, they learn more about it. By oh, yeah. And then when you have difficulties, they understand it. Right. And that's it's the not a surprise. Always lead with bad news, you know, and you don't hold bad news. You give them the bad news real or yeah. and constantly um, because, you know, bad news doesn't last anyway. It's just a bump in the road and you're going to move on. But uh, so Greg does spends a lot of time in sharing the reports and uh, being in touch and on the phone. I mean, De Greg, you might describe some of the things that you do with the investor groups. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say for me, it's mostly... Um, I mean, especially, I mean, I guess for myself, I don't, um, you know, I didn't have a professional professional background before this. I couldn't go to friends asking for money. Um, so I, you know, I really had to utilize Ari Mentor and then there's some networking events just around Boston, just kind of greater Boston, you know, events. Um, a lot of them were at first were kind of just fixed and flippers around Boston. And I wasn't really getting too much value out of those, but eventually kind of a, a few multifamily ones kind of popped up here and there. So I'd kind of do the rounds around Boston um, and, um, and then, yeah, just kind of, you know, put them in my, in my, uh, you know, CRM and kind of keep them, you know, keep them in the loop on what's going on and do, we try and do, I try and do quarterly newsletters to, you know, my entire network, do a blast out. And then uh, do you write the whole thing yourself or do you use a company to give you a uh, template? I write it. I write it. Um, nice. So I used to try and do monthly, but I couldn't really keep up with it. So. I, uh, I just went quarterly, but um, so yeah, I think it just, you know, giving, giving them information on, on what you're up to and keeping them in the loop. So it's not like when you send them a deal, that's not the first time they're hearing from you in over a year. Um, right. So. And we've had, uh, some of our investors are in multiple deals with us, so that that's helpful too. Um, because we're, our pitch is, you know, we're diversifying even in a conservative real estate investment, you know, because we talk about real estate as a conservative investment. It's not the stock market. It's not a wild ride. It's conservative. Um, yeah. And uh, and then even so, we double layer in diversity. So being in separate markets, because even in a real estate market, you have different things going on in different markets. So you want to hedge against even those kind of changes. So that's how we've rationalized to people why you would want to be in multiple markets. One, because you need to be to find the deals. You just have to be. It's just a reality to be in four or five. to Especially, especially in this time. 
Yes, I mean, yeah. just gotten, you know, I it's, did my first one and first purchase was in 2013, 2012, 2013. And it was a different world when I started mm -hmm. uh, taking, you know. It was the beginning of the, it was near the beginning of the cycle. I mean, the cycle started happening again, 2010, 2011, right. you know, and then you start, you're riding the up train. There's, there's plenty, there's plenty of deals in, in different emerging markets and, yeah. you know, you can pump out three, four five deals. And then as we go later in the cycle, yeah. you know, uh, the, the, the good markets move into tier sharing markets, tier sharing markets never produce multiple deals yeah. and you have to start doing one-offs. But yeah. then, you know, we're about, we're about to go right back into that, that, that cycle again, which is so exciting. You know, 2022, 2021 fall, 2022, it's going to be bye, bye, bye. We, we, we'd always get two, the third, and then by the fourth, whew, yeah. market was done. We were, you know, it had taken off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we always, we always, so in each of these markets, we have at least three deals, and then we could never get to the fourth quick enough. And then the market took off, which, you know, that's not a bad thing, but. <laughs> it's not. All right, you guys ready to play lightning round? Sure. Do it. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you questions, and then uh, first thing that comes to your mind, that is going to be your answer. Okay. So you can you can you don't have to uh, answer in order, whoever, uh, and you can both answer the the questions. So on a scale of one to ten, how good are you at keeping secrets? Uh, seven. <laughs> Matt. Eight. Hey, I'm a lawyer. You're a lawyer. You're supposed to be a ten. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> All right. Uh, Godzilla or King Kong? King Kong. <laughs> King Kong. Who was your first celebrity crush? Um, Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> first celebrity crush? Had to have been Farrah Fawcett. Farrah Fawcett, Charlie's Angels. But you had that poster on your wall. <laughs> Everybody. Who was your <laughs> morning or night person? Morning. Uh, morning. If you could travel back in time, where would you go? I'd, I'd go to meet Jesus. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Matt, uh, Greg? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Not sure. Okay, we'll go to the next yeah. one. What's your favorite pizza topping? Uh, sausage and onion. Uh, feta and spinach. By the way, for those that are you listening to some of these answers, when you meet these guys at Ultimate Partnering, you'll know where to take them for dinner <laughs> or, or what to order for them or send a pizza to their room. Um, the place you most want to travel to? Um, hey, Hawaii. Um, Poland. Poland, nice. Um, are whoopie pies really pies? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Are whoopie pies really pies? Technically, they are not pies. I would say no. All right. What's your favorite childhood TV show? Um, Hogan's Heroes. Uh, a SpongeBob. <laughs> All right. What was your last Halloween costume? Um, it was like a warlock of some sort. Uh, I was... Um, What's his name? Matthew McConaughey in Days and Confused. <laughs> awesome. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right. And the very last question, do fish get thirsty? Yes. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> all right. So that was, that was another additional multifamily deal lab with Matt and Greg Donahue. And that's how they did that deal. See us uh, again uh, on this podcast. And um, we'll take it from there. Good. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave.